Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie Bainishi, and I serve as Executive Director of the Global Health Technologies Coalition. We're a coalition of over 42 nonprofit product development partners, academic institutions, and aligned businesses working to advance global health research and development of drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, and other medical technologies specifically for use in low income, low resource settings and all around the world. We're really delighted to be joined with colleagues from Duke University um, who've been working with us over the past year to advance some research looking at the WHO, the World Health Organization's pre-qualification uh, program. Uh, we've got a presentation today called Navigating Complexity to Improve Global Access, Supporting a More Efficient and Effective WHO Pre-Qualification Program. And today's presentation is the culmination of almost, I guess, a year's worth of work uh, between our research teams looking at this program. Why? Um, we know that the WHO PQ program plays an essential role in facilitating access to safe, effective, and quality assured products, particularly for low and middle income uh, countries. Um, but we've also noticed, especially in light of COVID, there's an ever shifting and ever changing regulatory environment. And we wanted to take a fresh look at this program to see how it fits in with the rest of the regulatory ecosystem, confirm and ensure that it's fit for purpose, um, and then think about what feedback could we gather from the broader community that might inform the WHO and the PQ program about how it's working and how it could work better, and also to pull together information for the community to help to add transparency and a little bit of guidance and information about how PQ works for those who don't understand it as well. Um, so today's presentation, I'm going to turn things over to um, a wonderful, wonderful fellow research uh, colleague on this journey, uh, Dr. Alina Earl Ray Hodges from the Duke Center, uh, the Duke, Duke Global Health Innovation Center, who will share a few of the key insights from this research, a few of the recommendations. Um, following that, we will hear from Dr. Rogerio Gaspar, uh, who leads the WHO PQ program. And then we're going to engage in a, in a Q&A and a bit of open discussion uh, with some of the researchers who put this, this report together that we're launching today. Um, I will note that the session is recorded and we'll get to Q&A. We may not get there just yet, so save those questions for the latter part of the meeting, but you'll see on the bottom part of the screen that there's a Q&A box and that's where I'll be looking for your questions. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll turn things over to Alina. Thank you so much, Jamie. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. So I'm going to dive right into the content today from this work that we've undertaken over the last uh, several months, almost a year. Um, our primary research ob objectives for this work uh, are to increase uh, awareness and understanding of the WHO pre-qualification program, including how the pre-qualification process works, its nuances, exceptions, and also to understand the alignment with other national and regulatory uh, bodies. Uh, secondly, we uh, were seeking to also identify some actionable recommendations to strengthen this process. We conducted a mixed methods research approach uh, by analyzing time span data on 26 products that were pre-qualified by WHO across medicines, vaccines, vector control interventions, and diagnostics. We also interviewed 22 experts, uh, product developers, regulatory experts, as well as um, individuals um, at WHO uh, focused on the pre-qualification program and other related activities within the division. Briefly, I uh, wanted to provide some history and context of the WHO pre-qualification program, which began in the 1980s focused on uh, serving as a quality assurance mechanism for childhood vaccines for UN agency procurement. Uh, in the early 2000s, the program expanded to assess the safety, quality, and efficacy of various products uh, and added medicines, in vitro diagnostics, and vector control products over the years. Uh, which then ultimately uh, has been helping UN agencies, LMIC governments, and other institutions uh, to, to procure these WHO certified products. 
Generally, we recognize that there's strong consensus, as Jamie just mentioned, regarding the success of the pre-qualification program in facilitating access to health products in low and middle income countries. And PQ does serve as a regulator for the global market, ensuring that products are appropriate for use in these low resource settings, but also setting stringent standards to ensure that the products that are available in these low resource settings are of equally high quality uh, and safety as those compared to uh, those that are available in high income settings. Uh, Pre-qualification is certainly not an isolated process. Uh, and, and certainly coordinates with national regulatory agencies in the broader ecosystem for access to health products. There are many activities upstream from pre-qualification and those products uh, seeking pre-qualification uh, generally uh, you know, must receive regulatory uh, approval prior to pre-qualification. That's not always the case, but in many instances that is. So these products are undergoing uh, regulatory assessment um, elsewhere prior to pre-qualification. Uh, but also there are activities at WHO that must occur uh, and criteria that must be met in order to uh, receive pre-qualification. Uh, Pre-qualification coordinates with these national uh, regulatory agencies. Uh, they conduct data sharing amongst each other, uh, offer joint reviews of products, uh, enable technical assistance uh, to each other, uh, and coordinate strongly uh, together. Downstream from pre-qualification, uh, we recognize that the products that are pre-qualified must still receive regulatory approval from, uh, from national bodies. Uh, in order to be used in these countries. Um, once pre-qualification is received, uh, that also, again, enables procurement by UN agencies and other entities. Um, and then ultimately, uh, these products then, uh, once they receive regulatory approval in countries, are then uh, distributed. There are several processes as well that support the acceleration um, of products product access in low and middle income countries. And one example is the WHO's collaborative registration procedure, which is both for pre-qualified products and non-pre-qualified products uh, where countries uh, work together with WHO to accelerate uh, product access in countries. Now to dive a little bit uh, deeper into the actual pre-qualification process itself, I think it's important to note that uh, within uh, the pre-qualification team, there are five separate product streams, um, each with their own specific process for pre-qualification and each with their own specific requirements. So I wanna set that stage in advance. Uh, but in general, uh, we've identified that the process can be broken down into these four steps, which I will go into a bit more detail. So the first step is for a uh, product to be deemed eligible for pre-qualification. So the pre-qualification product streams announce which products are elig eligible to apply for PQ if there's sufficient evidence to make a determination of safety, quality, and efficacy. So the product streams are, uh, they have a pipeline of products which they uh, have reviewed, they understand the program teams within uh, WHO member states and, and other places that, that understand what the needs are in those countries. And they make a determination um, of which products then are, are wanting to be eligible for PQ. So for example, the medicines team will release expressions of interest which essentially notify, notify manufacturers that these products um, are then eligible for PQ. And manufacturers can then follow product stream specific processes for notifying PQ of their intent to submit their product. So once the, the manufacturers have submitted their intent, then they are then working with PQ to uh, ensure that this product is indeed eligible. And then they undertake the dossier submission process. The dossiers um, and, and the submission process have rigorous standards, uh, again, to ensure that LMICs do receive the same quality products as those available in high income countries. Um, typically incomplete dossiers are not accepted but we have been uh, certainly pleased to learn that WHO does provide significant technical assistance to manufacturers and particularly those uh, manufacturers based in low and middle income countries 
to support regionally distributed manufacturing uh, capacity. Following the dossier submission, then the dossiers are reviewed by WHO PQ product stream teams. Uh, typically, uh, the review process is prioritized in, in a few ways. Uh, first come, first served. Uh, so those uh, dossiers that are received first, you know, may be reviewed first. In addition, if there are public health emergencies, those products may be reviewed uh, in a priority order, similar to COVID. Uh, also in instances where there is no pre-qualified product in that category, they may be reviewed uh, first. Uh, and then finally, also manufacturers that respond fast to questions from PQ um, and participate in a, in, a, in a timely manner in the process, they may also have products that are pre-qualified um, in an accelerated manner um, so that they can sort of limit the queue, if you will, or, or reduce the queue of products. Uh, as part of the dossier assessment process, there is additional collaboration with technical experts, particularly for uh, novel and in innovative products that might be in the pre-qualification uh, work stream. Secondly, there's also a, sort of an abridged assessment process or a, an accelerated assessment process, if you will, for products uh, that have prior stringent regulatory agency or national regulatory agency approval. Uh, this process, uh, you know, involves joint, it can involve joint dossier reviews um, and just in general provides an accelerated assessment process for these products. Uh, it's important to note also that this uh, dossier assessment and review process consists of the time taken both by WHO to assess the applications, but also time taken by manufacturers, again, to respond to questions and participate in other um, activities. Finally, if a successful, if the dossier assessment process is successful, then this leads to the product being added to the WHO's list of pre-qualified products. I think important to note here is that uh, WHO guidelines are a prerequisite to the listing of a product um, on the, the pre-qualification list. And I will review that process momentarily. So for WHO, a guideline is any information product developed by WHO that contains recommendations for clinical practice or public health policy. Typically the guideline development process, which sits outside of PQ, is triggered, triggered by early or interim product data and spearheaded by the guidelines review committee. Guidelines also cannot be published or publicly released until the original data on which the guideline is based is also published in peer reviewed literature or other respected sources. So there's a bit of a, a, an additional activity, if you will, that takes place uh, in addition to PQ. And so these recommendations must be uh, recommend, or these products must be recommended for use first uh, and then can be recommended for procurement uh, with the pre-qualification listing. And so there is strong alignment between the guidelines teams at WHO and the pre-qualification teams. In addition, we conducted quantitative research and, and measured these time spans uh, between uh, PQ dossier submission and the actual pre-qualification listing so that we could understand what the time frame is across the product streams. You'll see on the, the chart here that we have mapped uh, vaccines, medicines, vector control interventions, and diagnostics, and those that we have data on with PQ dossier submission dates, as well as then the pre-qualification listing dates. We've identified the time spans uh, for the, the full assessment process, as well as the alternate or abridged assessment process, which is that accelerated process. And you can see here that the um, alternate or abridged processes in the blue dots are uh, seemingly faster than the full assessment process. Um, it's important to note that uh, WHO has identified key performance indicators uh, for their, uh, their specific full assessment activities. Uh, so they are, uh, their goalpost is set at 270 calendar days or approximately nine months for the WHO specific activities. 
And within the abridged assessment category and those WHO specific activities, they are aiming for 100 calendar days or approximately three months. And at this time, we have not seen any manufacturer response time expectations uh, within, uh, within WHO's materials. We also, uh, through this process, have not understood uh, what the, uh, what the, what their data looks like in terms of uh, reaching these KPIs. So we're not quite clear on whether these goals are being achieved um, or not. Uh, I also wanted to note that within this data as well, we have not received uh, or have not found dossier submission dates for the vaccine. So we weren't able to uh, study the vaccine timeframe except for one vaccine, which is looking like uh, it takes around 35 months. Uh, for the PQ process. Another data point is looking at the WHO guidelines process and whether the guidelines uh, actually were released before pre-qualification as was as is the prerequisite or after pre-qualification. And you can see here that about 42% of the interventions that we studied have had guidelines released after a PQ sort of indicating some historic variability in this pledge to release guidelines prior to PQ. So at a high level, a few key takeaways and challenges uh, according to the process, uh, recognizing again that guidelines are this prerequisite to pre-qualification and that the teams, uh, the guidelines teams do function outside of the PQ program in their respective health or therapeutic areas. And interestingly, you know, the interface between guidelines and PQ is not well understood by outside stakeholders. Additionally, stringent standards within the PQ dossier requirements may necessitate additional support to manufacturers. We've understood through this process that significant effort has uh, or is required to address the high data and evidence standards by manufacturers that dossier uh, processes and dossier completion processes can be challenging for manufacturers and also interacting with PQ's uh, team of consultants uh, is it can also be uh, a challenging situation for, for some team members, fully recognizing that the consultants working with PQ are working hand in hand with uh, full-time permanent staff members on the pre-qualification team. We also have seen unclear timeline expectations, as, as I just mentioned, with KPIs being released in 2017, but data has not been publicly reported on, on how well PQ is uh, achieving these goalposts. Also important to recognize that manufacturers also contribute to these timelines uh, and may uh, contribute to faster or slower timelines, depending on response times. We've also seen uh, missing data and the need for greater data transparency on the PQ process. And also a final point here uh, as it relates to the COVID therapeutics, uh, we have not seen updated data on the status of the COVID therapeutics in the pre-qualification process since April, 2022. So we do hope that that information will be updated shortly. Some additional takeaways. Um, external perceptions vary on the scope of pre-qualification and which products are covered within PQ and the extent to which the PQ teams assess both novel and generic products. Certainly, we understand that the PQ team does assess both novel and generic products and historically uh, generic products have, uh, there have been more generic products uh, that have been pre-qualified, uh, but recognize that both certainly are assessed. PQ is also not an isolated process, as I mentioned at the outset, coordinating with national regulatory bodies and other agencies, but also coordinating uh, and working in tandem with internal teams at WHO focused on national regulatory strengthening and local production and assistance units to accelerate access to health products in low and middle income countries. We've also seen that there can be duplicative regulatory requirements and limited data sharing between uh, national regulatory agencies, which can result in inefficiencies for PQ and product manufacturers. In addition, PQ resources, 
such as human resources and financial resources are mismatched with some of the expectations and relating to the importance of this PQ function. Um, we understand that there are limited uh, permanent staff members on the PQ team at headquarters in Geneva. Uh, we understand that this is due to WHO member states policies, which restrict the number of permanent staff that can be on that can be hired. Um, and therefore, having the PQ team rely on consultants, uh, long term consultants um, uh, to support many of the processes on the team. And finally, we understand that there is an administrative burden uh, from the variety of grants that are received by the PQ team, which is funded through voluntary contributions uh, and manufacturer fees, uh, but certainly understand that there is limited staffing to support uh, this, this administrative side of grants management. And then finally, uh, we have seen that there have been two new opportunities for external input and engagement um, outside of an annual meeting focused specifically on manufacturers uh, and, and speaking specifically to dossier processes. So I think greater opportunity exists for uh, additional input from other stakeholders. And finally, uh, we have identified four key recommendations for the WHO's Access to Medicines Division and the pre-qualification team. The first one focused on improving reporting and communication to generate greater clarity for stakeholders. One of the first uh, recommendations within this larger, larger topic is we are recommending and encouraging WHO to publicly release data on the performance indicators so that external entities can have a greater understanding of, of how well these goals are being achieved and where there are opportunities um, both for WHO, but also for manufacturers to improve, uh, improve their response times and activities. In addition, uh, we call on WHO to launch a public database of complete timeline information on all pre-qualified props products, again, so that we can better understand uh, the timeframes of these activities. And finally, we also encourage WHO to develop additional resources to help product developers navigate PQ and to better understand the interactions between the WHO guidelines teams and the pre-qualification teams. In the second recommendation, we call on WHO to support the expanded use of interim or living guidelines for novel products. Supporting these living guidelines uh, or these living guidelines provide real time information to help decision makers and may reduce delays in the pre qualification process. So, as these living guidelines have been developed for COVID therapeutics recently, uh, they enable those guidelines to be updated on a more frequent, uh, frequent time frame, uh, which then can potentially enable pre-qualification to occur faster uh, if they are not waiting for guidelines to be released before the pre-qualification listing can occur. In the third recommendation, we are asking WHO to provide greater opportunities for external stakeholders to inform pre-qualification processes and strategy. And within this strategy, we call on WHO to improve platforms and consultation processes for gathering ongoing feedback from both product developers, but also regulators and other product ecosystem actors. And finally, we, add, we encourage WHO to advocate for WHO member states to adopt a new policy to enable the pre-qualification program to hire additional permanent staff and reduce the reliance on consultants. And I thank you for your time today. And Jamie, I will turn it back over to you. Perfect, thank you, Alina. Um, thanks for running through all of this. Obviously, again, as she noted, you know, the PQ program is not a monolith, that there are these many pathways in terms of how these products are reviewed. Um, and it's a little bit of a different journey. And I think one of the insights we saw across the interviews that were conducted is also just the wildly um, different perceptions of the PQ program, depending on which stream you were in or sort of where you were at in the product development journey. Um, 
but you know, this is our attempt as a as a community to roll this up and sort of look at some of the macro level insights. Um, but also really eager to hear from Dr. Rogerio Gaspar, who leads the WHO PQ program, um, just to provide some comments, some reactions to what you've seen and heard today. Um, over to you, Dr. Gaspar. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Elena, for the presentation also, and thank you to the colleagues from Duke and GHTC to having conducted this uh, full review. First of all, let me say that we acknowledge and congratulate the two promoters of this uh, review uh, for the initiative. It, it is really important that relevant stakeholders join efforts to improve the efficiency of the pre-qualification program in order to attain a wider equitable and affordable access to quality assured medical products. And second, uh, I would like also to recognize that in recent years, due to organizational changes, followed by the full commitment in the response to the current pandemic, we have not been always very active in ensure adequate communication at all levels on non-pandemic related issues. Uh, this has been particular uh, stressing for the structure in the last two and a half years, as we all know. Thirdly, uh, to take the opportunity to challenge for further steps in the future in the deep co deep collaboration, in that collaboration in these related areas of interest, and to say that uh, uh, partners like uh, GACC or Duke have now uh, an opportunity to participate in a more structured manner in our discussion and continuous improvement through uh, the participation on the coalition of interested partners. So that's a structure that is working directly with us of the interested partners on a structured manner, not a one-to-one -one basis, but on a structured manner, impacting on our strategic decisions and our management also. Having said that, I think that's, uh, uh, there's a number of issues. I will go through the different parts of the report to highlight some of the issues. I might not have really time to go in depth, but uh, the report deserves to be commented in depth because it has not only rich information that needs to be on the public domain, but also a number of misrepresentations and factual errors that in, in our view are mainly uh, coming for the lack of communication, which is partly our responsibility. But just to give an example, of course, on the methodological side, when we look at 26 products on the universe of 1,125, you have mistakes that occur and impact negatively on the quantitative assessment that is being done. So having said that, I, I, I would like to start for, because this is a very important session for all the participants and for the ones that these participants will communicate after the session, to also um, highlight very clearly the differences that are not evident on the representation of the pre-qualification program. The pre-qualification program has been, and this is the question about function and structure at WHO. The pre-qualification program has been for a long time in isolation, completely in isolation. Since 2018, 2019, this changed with the creation of the department. I'm currently the director and was previously directed by Imer Cook, the current director executive of the European Medicines Agency. So this department incorporated three different streams that were not together and for a substantial reason is that they need to work together to facilitate uh, equitable and affordable access for quality assured medical products. So pre-qualification is not a department, is not a division, is not a team. These are different terms that I heard during uh, Elena's presentation. Pre-qualification program is now centered in a unit inside the department, and it is composed of a number of teams that go through different streams of medical products that need to be separated because of one important issue that the report doesn't highlight, which is the huge differences in regulation of the different medical products that we consider. You cannot put on the same basket medical products or vector control products. You cannot put on the same basket vaccines or diagnostics because they are different in nature. They are different in technology, but because also the level of global harmonization in terms of the regulatory frameworks are completely different worldwide. So the department now is these three units, pre-qualification, regulation and safety, and local production and assistance. And they are working in cooperation together for um, 
for example, having a, a simultaneous impact on the pre-qualification process. You cannot have manufacturers with a high quality of files being submitted to pre-qualification if you don't have a strong technical assistance unit. This was a function that WHO provided a number of years ago. It was stopped. We restarted this last year on the on the this, during the discussion of resolution WHA 74.6 which is a strong mandate coming from the member states to reinforce uh, distributed local production. And this is inserted in a more wider strategy adopted by WHO member states in terms of ensuring that we are moving to a global health security agenda in which this distributed capacity of manufacturing is an essential part. And of course, if you have the distributed capacity of manufacturing, you need to have the quality for the manufacturing processes, but you need also to have the regulatory oversight. And this is something that the regulation and safety unit, the regulatory system strengthening team and others are providing using the global benchmarking tool. And importantly today, as we speak, 70% of the member states of WHO do not have a regulatory authority that attains the maturity level three, which is considered to be a maturity level for a functional agency according to our standards. So our role is very important to support all 194 member states and particularly those of low and medium income countries because uh, they don't have really, uh, some. most of them don't have the capacity, the technical capacity to provide that function in isolation. But we are not a regulator and this needs also to be clear. We provide regulatory functions to assist and to support the member states, but we are not a regulator because by definition, we don't have sovereignty over a territory. So the regulatory oversight cannot be enforced with that sovereign um, capacity that is part of a state or a government uh, institution at a specific member state. So to understand exactly how WHO has to move, we have to move with, within the framework of existing regulatory authorities. And this is particularly important for innovative products, for example, and genetics uh, or following the SRA approvals. Of course, some uh, there are some products where you don't have existing products on countries with stringent regulatory authorities that we need to go through uh, a PQ process in isolation. This was referred, but these are of course still exceptional cases, not the, the generality of, the, of those. The other point that was referred is that um, we don't evaluate uh, new chemical entities. Well, Pre-qualification was never designed to do that. It was always designed to support and following uh, approval by stringent regulatory authorities, but specifically to focus on the genetics. It's true that in the last two and a half years, and particularly with COVID-19 pandemic, if you look in, on the vaccine side, for example, our activities has been dealing with innovative products because these products never existed before the pandemic and they were developed during the pandemic and certainly pre-qualification and the vaccine team together with our R&D blueprint team and the science division inside WHO and reaching out with manufacturers for the development and also with a number of reference regulatory authorities provided a good example how we can in the future also improve our, our processes. But this difference of, uh, between what is uh, pre-qualification and uh, the structure, the function, the fact that we are not a regulator, that pro but provide regulatory functions to assist and support member states. It's very important to be clear from the beginning. Then also to state that we, uh, uh, we take very seriously uh, the processes related to continuous improvement and quality management systems. And we are currently in the implementation phase of a quality management system across the department. The embryo of that existed already in the pre-qualification program before it was merged inside the department in 2018-19, but not in the other two units. So we are now building the RPQ, the Regulation and Pre-Qualification Department uh, Quality Management System as we move also um, in, in the challenging times of answering different priorities at the same time. And as you know, we are now facing also two public health emergencies of international concern at the same time. So um, a, a fourth point I would like uh, to stress, and I referred it already, is methodological issues. And I think that the methodological issues, let me put also part of the blame on our side, 
needs to be addressed by a more comprehensive dialogue and permanent dialogue between us and institutions like the two that are represented here with this uh, report. Because only through dialogue, we will be able not only to share, but to explain the data that is so misrepresented in some parts of this report. So I don't put the blame on the researchers. They did it. They did it with the data they were uh, able to access. But the data do not represent, in most cases, uh, what is really the reality of the pre-qualification exercise, as it was already presented by external reports conducted uh, in 2018-19 uh, in the preparation of the transformation process that led to this department, but also the data that we share normally with a number of stakeholders that have a permanent relation with the department. You are wrong. You are certainly uh, uh, to the point when you say that um, most of those data are not publicly available. And let me be very clear on this to uh, manage expectations on that. And some of those data cannot be made available publicly because they pertain to the deficiencies of some manufacturers, but also to deficiencies of uh, in reporting and communicating from so some regulators, even global regulators, and even regulators of a uh, very high standard. And uh, without referring any regulator specifically, just to draw the attention for the conclusions uh, from the National Academy of Science uh, from the US um, uh, last October, 2021, a seminar that was held on the emergency use authorization by US FDA, but also a recent pub, uh, published article in Science on August 5th, which is co-signed by Peggy Amberg and other um, uh, uh, high-level regulators at some point in time in different regulatory agencies. So um, we have to recognize that this lack of communication between regulators before the pandemic was really one of the major issues that difficult to really the operation of a global process like pre-qualification. Um, the message of hope that I want to, to transmit is here also is that during the pandemic, we had a huge transformation and it was a step-by-step -step approach. It was not easy. It, it is not easy still, but we are in a much better situation now than we were two and a half years ago. Just to say that, uh, facilitating informal structures like the regulatory advisory group at the COVAX facility, but also the formal meetings of the International Coalition for Medicines Regulatory Authorities, and certainly solving specific issues on the approval of vaccines or oral antivirals for COVID-19 has really been a huge dimensional exercise that allowed uh, regulators to understand globally, to understand better what are the deficiencies in the process and how to improve those processes. And this is something that, as you know, is being systematically published on the website of the ICMRAS website, the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, and is um, uh, work ongoing also uh, in which WHO is having uh, an important and active role. Then also to refer that um, issues that pertain for, for example, there was a, a point that was referred during the presentation about 35 months for a vaccine approval. It's a completely anecdotal data. I don't know which, which vaccine is. I'm just assuming it reflects reality. But just to give you how anecdotal it is, if you go through the data, and these data are publicly available on the website, or only for 2021 and only for the COVID-19 vaccine, you can see 10 vaccines, 16 EULs, more than 70 manufacturers, drug substance and drug products, and more than 3,500 national regulatory authorizations in more than 150 countries. And this is only for 2021 and only for COVID-19 vaccines. And these are publicly available data that are regularly updated on the WHO website. I understand that the website sometimes has challenges to be consulted from the outside. That's why I, I think that a better dialogue uh, between us. It's important to direct also the attention where the sources are really in the structure of the website. O on the transparency of communication, I think I alluded already some of those points. And um, also an important point uh, for this first approach is that there's a general confusion during the presentation, not only on the structure, but also 
on the staff of the WHO. I think that most of the references to consultants are relating to staff on a short-term contract, which is different from consultants, which are not staff of WHO and are recruited occasionally for specific functions. And just to say that some of the criticism that is put on the report uh, just not apply to reality. One of those criticisms on page four or five, it's, it's really important because it's damaging for the reputation of the entire process and WHO. And I have to be very strong on that one. The quote there on page four or five is that interacting with PQ consultants, I don't know if our consultants or, or staff, who may not be as familiar with certain stream process suggests that external consultants working for PQ provide advice or information to manufacturers independently. We have procedures to avoid this. And if the, the report and the researchers found evidence of this, uh, we need to be informed because that will be a basic infringement of rules uh, of engagement that are very strict are part of the contractual arrangements and are completely forbidden by those contractual arrangements. So I have to be very clear on that one, because if there's one or another case like those, they need to be reported because it needs to be addressed uh, in a proper manner, which is looking at contractual infringements. This is not allowed by the current uh, contract uh, requirements. Well, I would have, I said yesterday to Krishna in a, in a separate meeting that I would uh, uh, go through the problems of eventually needing three or four hours to go through the report and commenting the report. But I think that some of the issues that I have here to, to mention um, can also be addressed because I have here dozens of references about misrepresentation of factual errors that are on the report. Again, this is not only the responsibility of the researchers. This needs to be brought on board also on the responsibility of the need for a permanent dialogue between WHO and stakeholders like the ones that I here represented. But uh, I will probably, Krishna, uh, if you will be in agreement with colleagues, uh, direct this for a post event in which we could address this in writing, point by point, going through the entire report, because there are a number of statements there that are really important not to be left without uh, a response. Let me be also very clear on the, and some of the issues will come through the questions and the, and the dialogue for the remainder of the session. I have to, to leave at the hour for the, the to support the DG at the press today. Is a, again, the COVID-19 weekly press that we have. But just in general terms, not agreeing with the, the way all references are there on the recommendations as the general agreement with um, from our side with the recommendations that are there. Again, reinforcing my first statement uh, today they go in general alignment with a common goal that the authors and us, we all share, which is to improve pre-qualification, which is so important for global access to quality assured medical products. Uh, but I think, again, that uh, a review of the reports to be more accurate in terms of some of the statements uh, would be important to, to perform. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Um, Jamie, uh, I would have, as you might imagine, I have in front of me several pages with annotated comments from, from our team. I could go on and on and on, but then it will be drying the possibility of having questions uh, and answering questions also, also to establish a dialogue with the other participants in the panel. Thank you from your side. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Gaspar. Thank you for your openness, your honesty, and your directness about elevating what you've seen, what you've heard from the, the report. And actually, I think that is the goal for all of the partners involved in this project, is to try and use this as an anchor point to say, this is what we've heard. This is what we've seen, right? You've talked about the researchers not having a full and accurate picture of the story, um, but a year has been spent trying to track down as much accuracy as, pro as possible. And so I think that's probably the most important illustrative example to take away from this meeting of if people are spending a year trying to track this down and it's not out there, we've got to figure out how to solve for that. And I think a lot of openness and willingness to have that two-way discussion and to make sure that we're also not misrepresenting PQ's uh, work as we engage with the broader community and think about where PQ fits into the broader regulatory ecosystem. Um, you, you've you mentioned a, a conversation with uh, Dr. Krishna Udakumayar uh, from Duke. And so Krishna, I'd love to invite you to join as well and, and make a few comments. Sure, thanks, Jamie. And uh, 
Dr. Gaspar, thank you so much for joining us. Always uh, great to have you with us. And uh, first of all, thanks to you and your colleagues for this uh, open dialogue and engagement. Uh, I think uh, I would just uh, make a couple of remarks. First, I think we undertook this and continue to believe that the uh, the PQ and access functions within WHO are critical for access to innovation globally. And our goal here is to try to bring more transparency, as well as to align stakeholders in a, in a shared mission to try to accelerate access to life-saving interventions, uh, especially for those that might not uh, have access otherwise in low and middle income countries. So we have very much a shared aspiration of, of moving this effort forward. I'd also say we welcome this type of engagement and we see this very much as the beginning, not the end of our work. Uh, exactly like you said, we would welcome uh, ongoing engagement and dialogue. Structure is great. Uh, the uh, in terms of the actual findings and some of the comments, I will say uh, we're always happy to continue to refine our findings and, and recommendations. Uh, we have been grateful for uh, your engagement in the process, along with those of your colleagues. Uh, we've gone through uh, at least one round of a full written comments and responses back, and we would welcome further rounds of of such dialogue with uh, with the PQ team as well. Uh, I will say, I, uh, everything we have um, written, the findings and the recommendations, uh, appear to be consistent with prior evaluations as well, going back several years. Um, and a, to the extent there may be factual errors, we certainly want to continue to address those. Uh, but I would say it is important to understand that uh, this is both qualitative and quantitative approaches that do represent the perspectives of important stakeholders for the PQ process. Uh, and overall, I'd say what uh, has struck us the most is exactly as Jamie mentioned, I think, you know, months and months of, of talking to people and looking at data uh, still leaves a, a opportunity for greater transparency. And we recognize that uh, the times are, are challenging in the midst of a pandemic and that uh, the PQ team has has done um, extraordinary work in addressing the needs of the pandemic with the EULs around the vaccines, um, addressing you know huge numbers of diagnostics, as well as now the therapeutics. So uh, we I think want this to be of benefit to the PQ team as well as the stakeholders that you serve. Uh, and to that extent, I think we welcome this type of dialogue uh, and very much look forward to following up and continuing to to do our part to make sure there's greater transparency and alignment. So thank you. Great, thanks Krishna. I'm now gonna invite actually all of the researchers and some of the stakeholders who've been involved in this process across the last year to turn on their cameras, please join the conversation. Um, I'm starting to get questions here in the chat. So this is the point where we'd love to hear from you in the audience. We've got about 12 minutes left, as Dr. Gaspar noted, he's got a presser coming up at the top of the hour. Um, and I think this is a chance to get some of that clarification. Um, I'm just looking at the first question here. Um, Dr. Gaspar mentioned that WHO is not in charge of a sovereign, right? It's, it's a um, serving as a body that's providing that gold stamp of approval, as I like to say, um, of its standards and norms as WHO, but it is not a directly a regulatory body. And the first question is, under what circumstances can a product be WHO pre-qualified without a national regulatory authority or stringent regulatory authority? Do we have examples? I think that the, the examples here are really products that are not in the market, so not regulated. And as you know, we have, um, uh, at least in, in recent years, uh, a different number of important programs. You have to remember that WHO is a specialized agency for global health on the UN system, um, which is different from other agencies from the UN system because we are not depending from the secretary in New York. We are really owned and managed by the 194 member states and World Health Assembly, something that is important to distinguish from other uh, UN agencies. So we are not the typical UN uh, dependent secretariat uh, linked to New York, but we are really much closer to, to the member states. And the priorities are defined according to a number of programs. So you have certainly in neglect with tropical diseases and other programs that we are interacting uh, intensively, a number of products that don't, they have at certain moment in time, a national regulatory approval that we can use 
as a first starter. And in that respect, it's our responsibility, of course, to provide the technical assistance to start the, the issue. I think it's a, it's a good example. Um, uh, I could eventually give a dramatic example, but the dramatic example would be again anecdotal. Uh, without referring numbers, we had probably three vaccines on COVID-19 that we were ready to issue the UL before the reference regulatory authority. And we had to wait in one case 24 hours, in the other case one week for the approval by the reference regulatory authority. We were ready to approve with the work completely done, but we have to wait because the process establishes that we follow an approval by a reference regulatory authority. Uh, and we are talking in this case, as you know, about uh, uh, stringent regulatory authorities. Let me say also something that I didn't have the opportunity and probably will not have the opportunity uh, in this dialogue, and it's important to communicate this. At the same time, we are looking at PQ and working on local production and assistance. And this is something that uh, just for those that are not aware, the local production resolution for WHA in uh, February 2021 at the executive board, at the support of 13 member states and the strong opposition for a number of member states. And finally was approved in May, a couple of months later, May 2021, by consensus, but more important than that, with the support of 102 member states. And I have to say the last two being US and Japan, just to give an example about the strong support for this resolution. The fact that we are expanding on that direction right now, uh, putting the framework on the ground and the intense discussion with the regional offices and country offices in specific countries to support local manufacturers is something that we are not going to see the results in pre-qualification the next year or the next two years. But it's a transformational change that in the long term will have a major impact in access to pre-qualification and to the entire process. And the same, which is much more immediate, what we are doing on the regulation and safety with the global benchmarking tool and the WHO listed authorities framework, the transitional phase from 22 27 is already initiated. We have, as you know, the, our first ML4, which is Singapore, it was announced. The most recent ML3 are Egypt and Nigeria. And we have, I can say that we have, between the day we are speaking now and the, we just concluded the assessment of NMPA, China for vaccines, which will be announced, I have to say, either Friday or Monday. So you just have to wait a couple of hours or days to have the, the, the announcement, but you can see from my face uh, in which direction it could go. So uh, we have between now and the end of next year, around 20 countries that will be submitted by 20 regulatory systems that will be submitted to um, full uh, uh, benchmarking with a purpose to become ML3. It doesn't mean that they will all become ML3 because they need to uh, fill the standards. So we are talking about close to 280 sub-indicators on nine regulatory functions that they need to fill to attain that specific level. So it's not taken. It's a lot of work uh, from our side, but also from the member states and the funders like the World Bank and the development banks that are funding also that reinforcement of the regulatory functions. Uh, but WLA, for example, we have 56 uh, regul regulators already there on the transitional arrangements. These are the previous SRAs, the previous ML3, ML4, the previous functional um, regulatory systems for vaccines, and also the regional reference authorities, which is the system known as the PAHO reference authorities in the region of the Americas with the, the, the UNICEF revolving fund associated for access for vaccines and other essential medicines, for example. All these 56 are now on, on also on the parallel track to become WLA, which is between ML3 and ML4, to be specific in the number of sub-indicators that need to be filled. And uh, we have just completed two pilots with uh, two agencies, and we'll be in the next couple of months performing a pilot with a regional uh, uh, regulatory system. And as you know, there's only one regional regulatory system, so you can imagine what is that, that system that encompasses not only 27 countries, but 27 plus two, plus the, 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 the global agency, which means 30 of the 56. So um, even though we have five years to do this transition to WLA, we are expecting that by spring next year, we'll have 32 of the 56 regulatory agencies already on the WLA phase, which was also some uh, planning and effort that are being done reinforcing the entire system. Pre-qualification cannot exist 
it doesn't exist in isolation. And let me say this also because it's important to differentiate. Sometimes the report doesn't do that well. The differentiate between different streams of products. We cannot compare what we are doing in medicines and vaccines with the huge problem that we have on diagnostics because at the start, we don't have an harmonized regulatory system globally. We don't have an harmonized, we don't have human resources on the regulatory agencies. To give an example, between the months of November and December last year, I had meetings with 18 global regulatory agencies on diagnostics, the high level ones, and I was able to extract the participation of a couple of hours of some staff from six of the 18, because everybody is stressed with the same problem, not having enough human resources to do this at a certain scale. So there are a number of global problems that we need to address. It's not WHO alone. That's why the dialogue with uh, civil society, with academia, with researchers, but also with stakeholders from the manufacturers associations and others, and diagnostics, we have been discussing a lot with FIND and PATH, for example, for, for some time about alternatives, because the manufacturer's quality is also very low after the pandemic compared to what we had before the pandemic in average. There was a dilution effect for the because of uh, newcomers coming to the diagnostic sector during COVID-19. And in general, we are facing much higher problems now than we were facing on diagnostics before the, the pandemic, because it might seem a contrasense, but it's natural if you look at the details of that. So all that together. <coughs> Sorry for being long, Jamie, but I think that I needed to say this and the budget before I, because it's the next question there on the budget. Uh, I'm not going to give you the exact budget because I think I would be fired. I think I'm not allowed to comment that, but uh, I can give an order of grandeur. So if I, I can tell you that in our budget at the department, PQ is close to 65% of the expenses of the costs, and uh, the PQ fees represent less than 20% of the revenues. I think this gives you an order of magnitude of the problem. And also to say something that is the exact figure for the department and the division, but not by chance, is also the same figure for the entire WHO. And this responds to the other part of the question. The member states are contributing with 15, the SES contributions for member states are 15.15% of the budget and 85% of the budget is voluntary contributions. And that's why it's so important the decision that was taken at WHA last May to look on an horizon that is long, but it's a, a road that we need to take, that in 2030, WHO will have a 50-50 portfolio with 50% assessed contributions, 50% coming from voluntary contributions. Hopefully, we hope also that those 50% voluntary contributions will be in a model that we have in our department for one of the funders, and I, I have to say it here because it's also one of the funders of this study, the, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we have specifically an umbrella grant in our department that covers not specific activities, but the entire strategic and action plan for the department for the period. And we would love to see at the WHO level more examples of that, not having earmarked voluntary contributions, but having voluntary contributions that can be managed by the DG and the management team in order to implement the strategic plan and not to divert from the strategic plan with specific requests from the funders that we can understand. They are aligned with the, the, their business and their priorities, but sometimes can be challenging for WHO, not only for us, but for the entire organization. Sorry for being long, but to be accurate also. That's very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Gaspar. And I think we will take you up on the offer for a more formal opportunity for engagement. We wish we could have three or four hours with you. You see there's a huge line of questions here in the chat. A lot of questions about reducing duplication in the yeah. you know, in the processes, a lot of questions about how to have better coordination with different yeah. regulatory bodies. Um, these are the questions we're hearing from the community all the time. Yeah. It's why we started this project in the first place. Um, Jeremy, following the, the discussion I had yesterday with Krishna, I'm sorry, Krishna, to put you on. It was a completely different topic, but I just wanted to highlight that you needed to be prepared that I was going to be critical today as, as I've been, because this is part of the job that we have to do. Um, I think that we can follow this. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we can do it in the next two weeks, because as you might imagine, 
two and a half years in the pandemic means that at least this uh, month I took the responsibility to let a lot of the staff to go on leave because I have staff here that was not going on leave for two and a half years. And, uh, and this, uh, you know, this has an impact on the health uh, uh, of the staff. So uh, we are really short on staff currently until the end of the month. Although I don't promise anything before the end of the month, but we'll try in September to go through the notes I have here already and compiling them in more detail in several of the streams to share with you. And the same, some of those questions that are really important cannot be answered without data from WHO. If you just provide us, we'll provide also a reader comment on that. That could be then forwarded by you to, to, to the ones putting the questions. That's my engagement here. And Krishna, as I referred yesterday, I know, I think that you guys need to start to consider to become members of the CIP because we have a format and a process where the partners are there to discuss these issues. This has been very important in terms of regulatory system strengthening. And I think it will be even more important what is coming up in the next couple of weeks because we are not only doing the WLA process we are also putting a pressure on the capacity building and we are going to launch a major initiative in global regulatory training centers very very soon i'm just dependent on our legal department to give the final clearance of the text to push the button and put it on the website but just to give you heads up it will come, it will be uh, around official languages of WHO plus Hindi and Portuguese. So there'll be eight uh, training centers. The responsibility of the submissions will be certainly for the member states and national regulators. But uh, we hope that um, as we will be publishing, they will bring also other stakeholders from society, including research centers and other partners to be part of those coalitions also to build those self-sustainable centers, but that will be acting under the umbrella of WHO, both RPQ and WHO Academy. And this is a work that I've been preparing with Agnes Buzan for a couple of months already in silent, but it's very, very close to, to be announced. So this is a heads up. Great. Now, thank you, Dr. Gaspar, thank for you. all of that engagement. I know you have to go, but uh, thanks very much for this engagement here. and. So we certainly remain committed. And as you can see from the interest here, I think there's a large community behind making sure that we stay engaged. So we will continue our, our follow-up here. So thank you. Okay, thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. And just a final word for our audience. There was one question about, is this report public? Yes, we published the report last week. So we will make sure to recirculate that. It should have been in the invitation for this meeting, but we'll recirculate that to all of our audience. Um, there are a ton of questions in the chat that we simply did not get have time to get to today, um, but our team is taking note of them. And we hope to serve as a convener to keep going and keep this conversation happening. So please send us your questions. We know some of them came in anonymously, um, not wanting to put themselves on the spot in front of WHO. It looks like WHO is also looking to, to try and share some additional information about what they've got coming up. Um, so we will continue to be here and help to serve as that uh, convener to keep this conversation going. Thanks everyone so much for tuning in today and wishing you all a happy and healthy morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're from. Thanks.